Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to First Free Church. We're glad you're here. Want to say hi also to all of those who are watching online. We're glad to have you joining us as well. My name is Adam Bowers. I'm one of the pastors here, part of the preaching team. And today we are continuing with our series called Why, the Why series. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. But before we do, I wanted you to know that we have about 250 people heading out to Colorado for our annual senior high camp. And this is an incredible, life-changing experience for a lot of young people. 250 people are going to be out there. It will be amazing. And many of them are traveling on five big coach buses right now, 18 hours to get to Colorado. And I thought it would be great if we would just take a moment here at the beginning of our message time to pray for them. And it's Father's Day, so who better to have pray for them than one of our dads? This is Jeff Arledge. Jeff has three people going on the senior high camping trip. His wife, who is a leader, his son, wife Amy, uh, son Mason is an intern, and daughter Madeline is a student on the senior high camping trip. So you get to pray three times as long if you want to, because you've got three people going on this trip. Would you pray, Jeff, for God to work in their hearts to really make this a life-changing trip for these young people, and of course for safety along the way as well. children and leaders have to worship you this week. Lord, we pray for their safe travel out there, that there be no issues with the buses, that they have safe and efficient stops along the way. And Lord, we pray that during the 18-hour bus ride, that, that you work on your hearts, that you open their hearts to, to receive your word. Lord, I pray for the leaders that they have your love in their hearts, that they may be examples to these children's children, that they, they may uh, be an example of Christ to them. Lord, I specifically lift up uh, the speaker, Steve, that, that he uh, gains wisdom from you and that you give him the words to speak into these children. Lord, I pray if, that there's, if there's any child there that hasn't committed their life to you, Lord, I pray that they do so this week. You know the, the hurts and the challenges that these children may have, and Lord, I pray that you touch them and, and that you meet these hurts and challenges in the only way that you can. I pray that happens this week, Lord. And of course, I pray that they have fun along the way, that they enjoy the, the beautiful creation that, that you have created. I pray for their safety, that there are no injuries during, during the hiking or the trips or the white water rafting, Lord, and that they actually get a little bit of sleep, especially the leaders. And Lord, I pray that... Uh, that you impact the lives of these children, each and every one of them, and that they grow spiritually, that they grow closer to you, and they, they bring that home with them. And finally, Lord, I pray for safe travels back and that they continue to love you and, and be an example to their friends and peers. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeff. So this morning... As we, as we watch our young people head out to Colorado, we are going to shift gears now to talk about the Why series. We're continuing this as part seven of, or, yeah, of the Why series. We've got two more to go. Next week is going to be Why Love. The week after that is Why Serve. And then we're going to have a Sunday focused entirely on prayer. We're getting really creative with the title. It's going to be called Prayer Sunday. And Prayer Sunday will be a day when we're just going to come here and we're going to pray. We're going to guide through a time of prayer together as a church. So make sure you're here for that in three weeks. We are all going to be just focused on prayer the entire time we're here. And uh, we'll have some scripture reading and some, some thoughts along the way. But it'll be mostly just us getting together as a, as a group of followers of God, as a body of Christ, to just spend some time in prayer together. And then after that, we're going to go back into the book of Mark for a while. We've been working through that for a while, kind of mixing it up along the way. I really like that format that was started before I got here, but I, I really enjoy it. We're going to be back in Mark for several weeks. And then we're going to launch into a series that I'm very excited about called How to Neighbor. And the idea between, behind how to neighbor is thinking through what are we going to do to reach out to our neighbors around this church, our neighbors around you, your neighbors at work, the people that you actually live around, the people you actually live with. You know, when Jesus said to love your neighbor, what if he didn't mean just that person that you run into on a mission trip one time, but actually to love your actual neighbors, the people that you are around? So we're going to talk about what that means, what that should look like for us. But today, we are going to look 
at the Why series, and our topic in particular, as you can see, is Why Give? Why Give? Now, I want to tell you that there are two kinds of pastors in the world. There are pastors who love to talk about giving, and there are pastors who hate to talk about giving. And the pastors who love to talk about giving have their eyes on a private jet that is really going to take their evangelism game up a notch. And the pastors who don't like to talk about giving understand that there is a conflict of interest when we do. Because here I am going to talk to you about giving, and the elephant in the room is that myself and the other pastors and the staff of this church receive income because you give. And so there's a conflict of interest there, and we should just be honest about that up front, just real about that fact. It's there. We, we get that. So one of the things that you're paying me for and us for is to manage that giving well, to steward it, to plan carefully, to oversee what is a, a fairly large ministry effort and do so with wise strategic planning according to the biblical principles that we read in God's Word. That's part of what that goes toward. You're also paying me to study God's Word and to teach and preach what God's Word says and not to leave a bunch of stuff out. And there is a whole lot that the Bible says about money and giving. So as awkward and as uncomfortable as it may be to talk about giving today, and I'm going to be pretty, pretty blunt and direct this morning, it's something that we just can't shy away from. We need to be willing to talk about this. But I want to get that out of the way up front, some caveats kind of as we get into this. If you're new here and you haven't been to church or you haven't been to church in a long time or whatever it is, you may be wondering, what is this all about? Do we do this every week? This whole message might be a little off-putting to you because it's so focused on uh, money and, and giving and you might wonder, do we do this every week? And the answer is no, we do not. Uh, but it is something that we should talk about. It, it's in God's word and uh, it's some, we're a family. We're a church family here. We need to be just open and honest about money and resources and giving and, and, and generosity and those things. Um, I want to tell you that I don't know who gives what here, so there may be a point in this service where I just happen to lock eyes with one of you. <laughs> and in that moment, you may think, he knows. I don't. I really don't. Neither do the elders, neither do the pastors. We have no idea. That information is kept very confidential. And I don't want this to feel like a guilt or pressure message, unless that's how God wants it for you to feel. That's not really my intention. In fact, I'm really glad that the offering has already been collected, because this is not meant to be a guilt you into, pressure you into, coerce you into, anything like that. That's really not biblical at all, and that's not the point for today. Today's message isn't going to just be about church giving. It's really about being a generous person. It's about becoming a generous person. It goes beyond church giving into what kind of lifestyle are you going to live so that you can be a generous person? What kind of sacrifices are you going to make so you can be generous? What are you going to teach your kids about being generous? I don't want you to leave here today and think that this was a message all about trying to take your money, all about trying to give to the church. It's really not about that. It's about becoming the generous person that God wants you to be. And money, which is talked about many, many times in Scripture, is something we'll do a whole series on in the future. But today we're just going to focus on one aspect, why give. So historically, Christians have been very, very generous people. A couple of weeks ago, John preached about community, and he used Acts chapter 2, which says this about the early church and kind of how they functioned. It says, oh, if it'll work, there we go, yep. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. So the early Christians were incredibly generous people. See, they realized that God had given them everything. His son sent to die for them. And because God so generously and graciously gave to them, they didn't hold on to their possessions as tightly anymore. They, they gave them up so that others could have when they had need. In fact, in a couple of chapters later, chapter 4, the believers sold all the extra things they didn't need, gave the money to the church leaders and said, hey, you, this is growing big enough now to where you guys are the ones that have to figure out who has need and who doesn't, and so you guys distribute this. They were generous with what they had. They were giving people. 
And that generosity continued for centuries. In the fourth century, Christian giving was so strong that it actually weakened an empire. And the Roman emperor, Julian, was very frustrated and concerned about Christian giving. Here's what he said. He said, these impious Galileans, that's the Christians, not only feed their own poor, but ours also, welcoming them into their agape. Agape, you know, means love. So welcoming them into their agape, their love, they attract them as children are attracted with cakes. So they're kind of luring them in with their kindness in his Viewpoint. Whilst the pagan priests neglect the poor, the hated Galileans, the Christians devote themselves to works of charity and by a display of false compassion, in his opinion, have established and given effect to their pernicious errors or their, their deadly, their harmful errors. See their love feasts and their tables spread for the indigent. You can tell he's really, really contemptuous towards the Christians. Such practice is common among them and causes contempt for our gods. Now, I just think that is so cool that a group of followers of God could be so passionate about doing what God says about being generous and giving. They could be so good at giving that they could actually weaken the government in the process. And for some of you, that's all you needed to hear this morning. (laughs) Pass the bags around again. We can weaken the government with our giving. But think about the testimony of this emperor. Hated the Christians, and yet he had to admit they are doing a far better job of loving and caring for and giving and being generous and sharing than the government or the false religions. It's amazing. Well, today, Christians are still some of the most generous people on the planet, but unfortunately, that isn't saying much. Most Christians honestly struggle with understanding whether they should give, how much they should give, how to give, and truthfully, many Christians don't give anything or very, very little at all. I read an article this week that said that the average Christian today gives less than during the Great Depression, which is pretty amazing. Of all the people that claim to be a Christian and go to church, Regularly, how many do you think give faithfully to their churches? Who thinks it's 50%? Anyone think 25%? Okay, how about 10%? Any 10% give faithfully to their churches? Okay, how about 5%? It is less than 5%. Less than 5% of Christians who attend church regularly, give faithfully to the church. And here's another surprising fact. If you make less money, you're more likely to give. If you make less than $20,000 a year, you are eight times more likely to give than if you make over $75,000 per year. Now, I told you that this wasn't going to be all about church giving, that it's not a guilt message, but... Those are statistics we need to know and understand. This is the state of the Christian church in this country. I want to zoom out a little bit. Let's look at all Americans. There's a book called The Paradox of Generosity that gives us this chart. 45% of Americans give zero, zilch, nada, nothing all year long to any cause. This is not just churches. They give nothing, 45%. 41% of Americans give less than 2% of their income all year long. 9% 9% give 2 to 5% of their income, 3% 5 to 10% of their income, and only 2.7% give 10% or more of their income away. So in some ways, we are a very generous country, and in some ways, we're really not. We can be pretty selfish with the unbelievable resources that we have. Here's what the authors of this book concluded. It stands to reason that the more money people make, the greater percentage of it they should be able to give away without cutting too much into their own basic needs and wants. That makes sense. But this is not the case. Making more money in America is not associated with giving money more generously. Earning a higher income in the U.S., in other words, does not translate into giving larger proportions of that income away. 
This is a well-established fact confirmed by many previous studies. In short, a quite small group of Americans gives away the vast majority of the money that is donated in voluntary financial giving in the U.S. Stated differently, while some Americans seem to be quite generous with their financial resources, the vast majority contribute very little, very, very little, to the overall giving that takes place in the U.S. So let's ask the question then. If this is what we're dealing with, let's ask the question, why give? Why should we be generous? And if you've studied the Bible much at all, you know you have a really good answer for that. Because God said so, right? And that's true. That's not a bad answer. Paul told the Corinthian church that God loves a cheerful giver. That giving should generally be on a regular basis and not all at once. He talked about that with the Corinthians. That Jesus himself instituted, he says in 1 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 9, that Jesus said pastors and preachers of the gospel should earn an income for what they do for the churches. In the book of Acts, Jesus says it is more blessed to give than receive. We also learn about all of those early Christians who sold their resources, gave them away, and gave the extra money to the leaders of the church so that it could be distributed. Giving is commanded over and over in Scripture, and the model of giving is clearly there for us, but we're not here to ask the question, should we give? The question we're asking is, why should we give? Why? Why does God care so much about my money, about my resources? They say that money doesn't grow on trees. But if God wanted to, I'm pretty sure he could make a money tree. He could get all the money that he wanted on that tree and just pull it off whenever he needed it. If God needs money, why can't he just manufacture it? Why does God care so much about my resources and about me being a generous person? Well, you know how it works here. We're going to open the Bible. So turn to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 19. If you have a mobile device, you can go to the Uversion Bible app, look at events, you'll find First Free Church. If you want to use your browser, you can go to efree.org slash Bible, and there's a link there that's going to take you to the same content. Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to be in verse 19. We're going to talk about what Jesus has to say in answering this question of why give. Why is it so important? Why does it matter? Now, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus starts a sermon that we're going to drop into the middle of this morning. It's a famous sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount takes place right outside this cool village called Capernaum. And Capernaum, you can see here, there's a lot of ancient ruins here that, that you can go into and kind of explore and see what all is there. It's all made from basalt rock, which is this black rock that's native to the region. So they build all these houses. There's a, that is not an ancient uh, house, by the way. That is a church that has been built over top of what's believed to have been Peter's house, where Jesus spent a lot of time. And so you can go there and actually see the ruins of what was believed to be Peter's house. There's a very good chance it really was, or at least one of these uh, most certainly was. And you can see that there. There's an amazing synagogue in Capernaum, the white synagogue. It, these stones, because they're white, and of course they're a little dirtier today than they would have been hundreds of years ago, but these had to be hauled a long, long ways to get to Capernaum. So this building, with everything else around it in black basalt rock, this building stands out. Now this was not the synagogue in place in Jesus' day, but if you go right underneath this, the foundation of the black basalt rock for the early synagogue is still there, the one that Jesus would have gone into in Capernaum. Pretty amazing place. And right outside of here, there's this hill, big hill. Uh, This is more of the, the white synagogue. And then you go outside a little ways, and you're at this hill. There's the Sea of Galilee. And this is the hill where most likely Jesus walked up it and sat down with his disciples sitting around him and the multitude sitting around them and he started to teach. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus started to teach with the Beatitudes. You know, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Uh, Blessed are the peaceful. And then he gave some teaching about salt and light, being salt and light in this world. And a number of moral issues like adultery, divorce, how to treat your enemies, keeping your promises and Then he talks about giving and money and possessions. And he gives them some information about this. And that's where we're going to drop into today in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus talked about a lot about money, actually. Almost half of his parables, almost half of Jesus' parables, 
deal with money. 10% of the verses in the Gospels deal with money. So this is a, a big topic that Jesus talks about. And in verse 19, we read this. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Now he's not saying that you shouldn't save or invest. In fact, Proverbs 21 says that a foolish person does not save up for the future and the wise person stores up resources for his future needs. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is using a, an illustrative approach of extreme contrast. And he's saying, here's one extreme example and here's another extreme example. So don't store up treasure. He's saying, he's saying it's far better to store up your treasure in heaven than on earth. It's a contrast between two kind of extremes. In other words, don't hoard your wealth on this earth, but invest in eternal things. Maybe some of you remember this radio host, Larry Burkett. He was a financial counselor, Crown Financial Ministries, and he used to say, show me your checkbook, and I'll show you where your priorities are. Anyone remember that? And today, I think I would, I would say two things. Show me your credit card statement or bank statement, whatever you use, and show me your calendar filled in from the last month, and I can show you where your priorities are. And that's kind of what Jesus is getting at here, earthly investments or eternal investments. And I want to illustrate this for you if I can. Let me just make two columns here. The first one is going to be earthly investments, earthly, and the second one is going to be eternal investments. And what I want you to do is think in your own mind, these two columns, where do you invest your money and your time the most? What has your priority? What has your focus? So on the earthly side, many of you, I'm sure, have a job. You spend a lot of hours there so that you can gain income, so that you can buy the things you need and want. Many of you have a house or rent an apartment or something like that. Maybe you have a car. Maybe you invest money in some toys, either for your kids or for you personally. You have different things that you like. You might spend time on your investments and a lot of time researching and evaluating and determining where, you're, where to put your money. Uh, of course, there's a lot of time that people spend just researching their next big purchase. I don't know if you're like me, but I can spend so much time researching my next purchase that if I added up the value of my time, it was worth more than the item that I ended up purchasing. Have you ever done that? It's like 10 hours of research to buy this $5 coffee mug. Probably not worth it. Now think about your eternal investments. This is where you might put something like giving, serving, sharing the gospel with other people, helping your family grow spiritually, helping your neighbors and friends grow spiritually, which one looks like a bigger priority in your life? If you look at your money and your time, which one is a bigger priority to you? Now, of course, we've got to be clear about something here because a lot of these things in the earthly column, depending on how you use them and how you approach them, can move over here. Your job can be an act of worship, God created us to work. He, he instituted work before the fall of Adam and Eve. Work is not a bad thing. Your job can be a place for you to do ministry and to be on mission and to share the gospel with people. So your job can move over to that category. You can use your resources for this category over here. But here's, here's Jesus' point in all of this. It's about priorities. What are you investing in? What is your priority in investing? And I'm going to give you three principles out of Matthew chapter 6 here. Three principles that Jesus gives us that help us to understand why give. And the first one is treasure in heaven matters far more than treasure on earth. Treasure in heaven matters far more than treasure on earth. It's about the contrast there. It's about our priorities. Not about the fact that you shouldn't have anything on earth. That's not what Jesus is saying. There are many great godly people in the Bible that were very wealthy but it's about your priorities. Does your life reflect the fact that treasure on heaven 
is worth a whole lot more than treasure on earth? Or is that where all of your focus is? Jesus goes on in verse 21 to say, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Now this is surprising, and here's why. We tend to think that wherever our heart is, that's where we'll put our money. And Jesus says, no, it's completely the other way around. Wherever you put your money, that's where your heart will be. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Whatever you invest your resources in, that's what you're going to care about the most. So principle number two is your treasure will lead your heart. Your treasure will lead your heart. And if you think about this for a minute, you know that this is true. When you buy a house, what suddenly has your focus for the next several months? It's that house. What are you most proud of after that? We got a house. What takes up all of your time as you try to unpack and fix things up and make it look the way you want it to look? What is, what is the biggest focus of your life in that time? It's that house. You just put a lot of treasure in that house. And so we're proud of that. Or you buy a new car, and all of a sudden, that car is the most important thing in the world to you. And nobody better touch my car. If you sit in it, you don't bring food in it. Did you just sneeze in my car? Get out. Because that car is so important to me. It's a priority because I put a lot of treasure in that car. And that's what Jesus is saying. It's, it's not that what you care about is going to get your treasure. So often, it's actually the opposite. Wherever you put your treasure, that all of a sudden now is what you really, really care about. And that's what Jesus is saying here. There's nothing wrong with a new house or a new car. That's not the point. The point is, is that where your heart is now? Is that what your focus is on? It's not about your possessions, it's about your priorities. That word focus is really important. That's what Jesus is really driving at. And in fact, he's going to give us an illustration now. If you look at the next verse, Jesus is going to give us an illustration about focus. What are you focused on? Verse 22 it says, Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. Now, Jesus is using terminology that was commonly used to understand things that were going on in, in a person. And the eye and the light and the darkness and all of that, that was kind of a common teaching tool. Let me just unpack that for you with a, with a principle so that you can understand what he's trying to say here. It would have made sense to, to his audience. It doesn't make as much sense immediately to us, but you can figure it out. Here's the principle that comes from this. Principle number three. Whatever has your focus will automatically impact your whole life. That's what he's saying. Whatever has your focus will automatically, in other words, you have very little control over it. Whatever has your focus will automatically impact your whole life. And oftentimes without you even realizing it. You won't even know it's happening. But what has your focus is going to start to impact your whole life. If your money has your focus, it's going to start to impact your whole life. If your possessions have your focus, your whole life is going to start to reflect that. If your clothes have your focus, your life's going to start to reflect that. If video games have your focus, your life is going to start to reflect that. If your phone, your whatever it is that you're into, if that has most of your focus then without you realizing it, that's going to start to be reflected in the rest of your life. You may not see it, but everybody else sees it. They know. That's so-and-so, and they're all about that because that has your focus. Your life starts to reflect that. Whatever has your focus will automatically impact your whole life. And Jesus says that it can be like a darkness that overcomes you your whole life. And he says at the end here, and if the light you think you have is actually darkness how deep that darkness is in other words if you think you're focusing on the right things but it's actually the wrong things that's even worse that is a deeper darkness why because you've deluded yourself into thinking that it's the right things it's even worse but when your focus is on healthy things when your focus is on 
the word of God and its principles and the truth of God's word and, and as Paul says in Philippians, whatever is pure and noble and true and of good report and, and it's focused on good things like giving and serving and being generous to other people and helping other people, when that has your focus, your whole life is gonna start to reflect that. See, a lot of our lives reflect the fact that we like lots of stuff. A lot of our lives become walking billboards for how much we've been able to accumulate. And that's what we're known for. All this stuff. Resources. It's not wrong to have resources. Don't get me wrong. But if that's what our life is all about, that's what our focus is, then our life's going to reflect that. People are going to see that. It's going to affect our whole life. When we focus on the healthy things, your life starts to reflect that. Your attitude is going to improve. Your self-control is going to improve. Your attention to others, your care for others, because now suddenly it's not about that thing that I wanted that I can't have. It's that I now notice what someone else didn't have that they actually need that I can provide. I've got one of those here. Instead of I wish I had a better one. See the difference of perspective there. When you focus on healthy things, when your eye is focused on the light, it's going to reflect in your whole person whatever has your focus will automatically impact your whole life and oftentimes without you even realizing now jesus is going to get very direct here in verse 24 this is our last verse he says no one can serve two masters for you will hate one and love the other you will be devoted to one and despise the other again he's setting up this extreme contrast for those of you that may have two two bosses sort of in some kind of arrangement like that jesus is not saying you got to pick one to love and pick one to hate He's setting up an extreme contrast here. No one can serve two masters. You will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. And here are the two masters. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to what? The devil? Money. Now that's weird. Because if I were going to set up a contrast between God and something that's the arch rival of God, I would choose the devil. But Jesus says you can't serve both God and money. Why does he do that? It's because practically no one actually thinks about serving the devil. Let me give you an illustration. Your boss invites you into his office and says, I'm going to give you a 50% raise. How many of you would like a 50% raise? Anybody? Anybody turn that down? Okay, here's the thing. You have to do something unethical clearly contrary to God's word for the sake of our company you're going to have to do this and then you're going to get a 50% raise and if you turn this down there is no chance you will ever get a promotion in this company again now there's a conversation happening in your mind but it's not a conversation like this it's not saying well I'm pretty sure that God doesn't want me to do this thing. Oh, but I really think the devil wants me to have that raise. Who do I make happy? Do I make God happy or the devil happy? Oh, I don't know. Who do I make happy? No, that's not what we're thinking about. It's not between God and the devil. It's, I'm pretty sure based on the principles of God's word that I shouldn't do this thing, but I could really use that money. It's God and money. The devil isn't all about gaining your focus. He's all about getting your focus off of God. He'll use whatever he can to get that. If he can get you focused on money and possessions, that's a win for him. Why? Because your treasure will lead your heart. And whatever your focus is on, that's going to impact your whole life. So if he can get you focused on treasure, he knows he's going to get your heart in that direction. And if he can keep you focused there, it's going to impact your whole life. That's a win for him. He doesn't need you to follow him. He needs you to not follow God. He doesn't need you to focus on him. He needs you to not focus on God. And money and possessions, those are some of his most effective tools. So why give? Jesus gives us three reasons, very simply, because treasure in heaven matters far more than treasure on earth. So be a giving person. Be a generous person. Because your treasure will lead your heart. When you're a generous giver, your focus is shifted off of you and onto others. When you're a generous giver, you start to notice the needs of people around you. I'm not just talking about church giving. I'm talking about just being a generous person to your neighbors, to your friends, to your family. You start to notice needs of others and opportunities for you to help them and bless them and be there to support them. 
When you're a generous giver, you demonstrate to God that he matters more to you than your money and your resources. I'm not saying don't save. Proverbs says we should save. We should be ready. We should be prepared just like the ant. But then we've got other income that we can choose what to do with. And do we spend it all on ourselves? Or do we give? Are we generous? Do we care for other people? And by saying, I'm not going to keep all this to myself, part of what I'm saying is, I trust you, God. I'm being wise, I'm saving, and of course I've got an amount that I'm living on, but I'm not gonna do that with all of my money. I'm gonna take a, a good chunk of it because I don't think I have to have it all because I'm trusting in God. It's, it's a one way of saying, I trust in you, God. It all belongs to him anyway. We're just borrowing it. It's his. He can give it, he can take it away. And number three, because whatever has your focus will automatically impact your whole life. When you are a generous giver, your heart and your whole life will start to reflect that. And those priorities of yours will change. Suddenly those little inconveniences that were so frustrating to you, I want this, I want that, this broke down, this, this didn't happen, those will seem far less significant because you're keeping your focus and your treasure on helping and serving and giving. And so those things now matter more to you than your personal inconveniences. It's a part of the way God grows us. It's a part of the way he helps us to grow spiritually and trusting and relying on him. God doesn't need your money. God doesn't need your money. But God knows how dangerous it is for you to be enslaved to money. And he knows how good it is for you and how growing it is for you to be a generous person. That's kind of the end of our message today because I really want to shift gears now into something that's, that's a little bit different, that's a little bit awkward, that I don't really want to go into, and yet I, I believe that God has made it clear we should. I think we have to have an honest conversation about just what giving looks like in this church. And I just want you to know where your giving goes. I want you to know what giving looks like in the church right now. So we're going to talk a little bit, just for a few minutes here at the end, about what giving looks like at First Free Church and how that impacts the ministry here. So if you're a guest, you can just tune out your ears if you want. This is kind of a church family. Just let's, have, let's sit down at the kitchen table with a cup of coffee. and have a conversation about the finances. Our chart in our weekly bulletin uh, has been a little bit confusing this year. It's, it's been a very good chart for us in the past, but this year it's a little weird. And the reason for that is that last year, the end of the year, we had uh, what I think is probably the, the single biggest month of giving ever in the history of this church. It was, it was pretty incredible. Um, I would love to challenge you to break that record if you're so inclined, but because of that and another large gift last year that happened halfway through the year, about a fourth way through the year, that sort of skewed the numbers. And so as we planned the budget for this year, we planned for, okay, if that happens again, here's how we would use that. And if that doesn't happen, here are some things we can cut back on. So we're planned for either scenario. And because of that, if you look at the weekly bulletin chart over the last few months, you might have thought, oh my goodness, we are behind but there's more that you need to know. So here's the new chart that you have now. We added a bar. Now not only do we show what is budgeted, that's what we could spend if at the end of the year we get a whole lot of giving like we did last year. We're not counting on that, but if it happens, we're ready for it. We've strategically planned for it. But then you'll also see last year's giving for this week. And if you were to look at this chart like a month ago, we were a little bit ahead of last year's giving for that week. And then four weeks ago last year, there was an unusual big $100,000 donation that came in. And so that sort of flipped us around so that now we are behind by a little less than $100,000. If it weren't for that special gift, which we're thankful for, we would actually be a little bit ahead of normal giving at this time. So I, I'm going to try to say something very carefully here, and then I'm going to explain it. What I'm going to say is this. We are not struggling in giving compared to previous years. Uh, we have increased our budget substantially based on a lot of giving last year at the end of the year. Um, and, and to be prepared in case that happens again, we're ready to do that. But if you only show that, it makes it look a lot worse than it really is. So we are not struggling in giving compared to previous years. We're tracking almost exactly. 
But our giving still isn't where we think it should be as a church. And I want to explain that. I want to, I want to share what that means and why we would say that. First of all, I would talk about the frequency of giving. So the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the Corinthian church, one of the interesting things he said to them was, don't wait and give money in one big lump sum. He said, do it weekly in accordance with your income. And I don't think he was trying to make a hard, fast rule here about saying, okay, weekly is it. You've got to give weekly or you're not in accordance with God's word. I don't think that was it. I think it was the principle of, hey, don't wait and wait and wait and leave people wondering if you're going to give anything or you're not going to give anything. What's going to happen here? We need a little more consistency than that. And in fact, maybe for you in your life, you need a little more consistency than that. You need that regular operation of I am contributing, I am giving, this is a part of my worship, this is something that I'm doing out of trusting God. Not, well, we'll see at the end of the year if I've got anything and then I can put it in there. So I'm not saying that's a hard and fast rule necessarily. And Paul didn't give a percentage. Paul never gave a percentage about giving. He talks about giving. Jesus talks about giving. Neither of them gave a, a percentage that we have to give. Of course, in the Old Testament, the people of Israel were told to give a, anyone know what that word is? A tithe. You all know that word. Did you know that a tithe was less than half of what they were supposed to give? See, that's a common misunderstanding today that, well, the tithe, 10%, that's what you're supposed to give. No, no, no. The Israelites, if you add up the tithe, which was just one portion of their giving, and then you take the other gifts and sacrifices they were all supposed to provide for the temple, it actually adds up to over 20%. It's about 23% or so of their income that they were supposed to give. So if you want to tithe, that's fine, but if you want to use that as your metric, it should really be more like 23%. And we're not going to stop you. Uh, but Paul never gives a percentage. Paul just says, in accordance with your income, in keeping with your income. Um, and so we're, we're not saying that there's some hard, fast percentage rule or that you have to give with a certain regularity. But I'll just tell you this. When you spread out your giving throughout the year, it allows for a lot better planning and consistency in the church, a lot more stability. Um, and so it's very helpful. My wife and I, we give to the church. In fact, you, that may be something you've wondered. And so I'm, I'm just going to be very vulnerable here. And um, if, you, if you don't like that, that's fine. I'm just going to do it. But we give to the church here. We have since we came here. We gave to our last church. Um, we, we actually continue to give to our last church a little bit even after we moved away from our, our last church. It's just we, that's how we've operated in our life. Um, I'm not going to tell you how much, but we, we do give to this church and we give to missionaries and other causes and, and those types of things and you know we feel that if God has blessed us with resources then we ought to be generous with those and you may have wondered okay do pastors turn around and give some of the money that they get from the church right back to the church uh, I can't speak for the other pastors because again I don't know giving records uh, but I'll tell you that we do and the way we do that is through automated e-giving and I know that's not for everybody. I'm just going to share with you what we do because it's, it actually is very helpful for the church. When you give through automated e-giving, what that means is there is consistency. You can count on that money being there. And so um, we do that. Uh, and every month there's a, a gift that comes into the church. And because of that, if there's weather, if there's a service cancellation, anything like that, none of that affects the giving. Because really, if there's a service cancellation, people still have to get paid. And utility companies still has to get paid. And the mortgage still has to get paid. And missionaries still need resources. And almost all of the expenses are still there. But when you have a week with a canceled service, or even one service, sometimes your giving will go down. So when you automate that, it, it takes care of that. I'm not saying you have to do that. I'm just saying it's an option for you. It's what we do. The second reason we're not where we think we should be is because of the number of givers. Now, uh, let me... Um, preface this by saying over the last several months our number of givers has gone up which is very encouraging uh, in fact that's the first time that's happened in a long time where the number of givers now is increasing instead of decreasing that's encouraging and yet when you look at the overall statistics it's still a little discouraging and here's why so when we look at our regular attenders again not by name but we're just talking big picture here our regular attenders 35% of people who give this church home don't give anything at all. And another 20% give to 
givers are and who aren't the givers and any of that stuff, and I don't need to know. All I know is that half of the people, more than half of the people that go to this church regularly, that, t- that use the lighting and the, the seats and the HVAC and the cleaning and the services of the staff and Kid Connection and care office and student ministry and all that, more than half of the people that get benefit from those things don't actually contribute much, if anything at all, to those expenses. And of course, not to the missions and the outreach and the things all beyond that that are, that are so important that we do here. Uh, so again, this is not meant to be a guilt or a pressure thing or anything like that. This is just a transparent family conversation about this is what things look like right now. Um, we're not struggling at all. We're, we're, we're doing very well and we're thankful for that and we praise God for that and we're thankful for your generosity. Um, but there may be some of you here who are thinking in response to that, you know what, I have not been giving faithfully. Um, and if that's you, then I would pray that the Holy Spirit would kind of work on your heart and cause you to consider whether you should give faithfully. And maybe it's not to here, maybe it's to somewhere else, but God wants us to be generous people. He doesn't want our heart to be focused on our treasure. So along those lines, I want to share one more thing with you, and that is where the money goes. What do we do with the money when it comes in here? Have you ever wondered that? Where does that money I'll go. Let me just give you kind of a big picture perspective. For every $10 given to this church, here's what happens to it. About 80 cents is used to cover our, our debt, the mortgage on this facility. So 80 cents goes to debt service. Another $3.60 goes to the facilities and support here. So that's the facilities team, the technical productions team, the gear, the equipment, all of the maintenance and electrical and, uh, and heating and cooling and all of that stuff, gas and whatnot, all of that is in facilities and support. Another $3.60 goes toward ministry here. So that covers our ministry staff, our pastors, uh, Kid Connection, and worship, and student ministry, and, and um, groups, and care, and all, counseling, all those other things. That's all under ministry. And that leaves us with $2 left. Where do those $2 go? Well, those remaining $2 go outside our walls to other ministry. Uh, that supports things like our missionaries and our outreach partners and the stuff that we do with Advent Conspiracy, all the stuff that we do that's outside of us in order to have a reach and an impact for God all over the world and in our community. Last year, we spent over $745,000 on ministry outside. And this year, we're going to spend even more than that on ministry outside of our church. So that's just that's where the money goes. You should know that. That's how your $10 would be used here. So my closing challenge for you is this. For some of you, this may have been a very awkward message. I'm including me in that. For some of you, this may have been a little uncomfortable. For some of you, this may offend you. Um, this, this may just be like, man, I can't believe they're talking about money in the church. This just seems wrong. Well, Jesus talked about it a lot. So I think it's okay. For some of you, this may be very convicting. This might be the type of message where the Holy Spirit is prompting your heart. Maybe he has been for a long time. In fact, maybe you felt kind of like God is sort of disciplining you. Maybe things aren't working so well for you right now and God keeps prompting you, you need to be generous and you're being stingy. And you need to be given. You need to not have your trust and security in your stuff and your money. And I want you to trust me. I want you to be giving with your resources, to be generous. I don't want your treasure to be in your treasure. I want your treasure to be people. I want you to give that and be generous to other people. I want you to be like the early Christians did. And so you can do that and God will allow you to face the consequences of that lifestyle. He will allow you to be miserable if you really want to. But if you follow God's commands and his principles, if you are generous with what he has given you, giving away a portion of what he gave you, because let's face it, he owns it all anyway. This is all his. Then your life is going to change because of that. And my advice to you is to, to just try it. See if God doesn't bless you for being generous. I'm not talking about here at this church. I just mean in general, in your life, with whatever causes, with something that's sharing the gospel with people, that's, that's helping other people, generous with your neighbors, generous with people in need. See if God doesn't bless you for that. See if he doesn't grow you spiritually through that. See if your focus doesn't shift from all that stuff that is kind of haunting you and keeping you self-centered to other people and helping other people. Why do we do it? Because treasure in heaven is far better than treasure on earth because your treasure will lead your heart and because whatever has your focus will automatically impact your life. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? 
God, you are a good, good father. You've given us everything we have. We don't deserve any of it. We may think we do, but even the hard work that we do is really just taking advantage of the opportunities that you've given us. And you have so blessed us with so much. So Lord, help us to be generous. Help us to get back to that early church mentality where our resources really don't mean that much to us and what we really care about is helping other people. Help us to use our job and our house and our car and whatever else we have to be a blessing to others. Help us to be generous in giving with our money and our resources so that we can trust in you and point other people to you and so that that's what we really care about more than our stuff. Help us, Lord, to be generous people. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you please stand with us?